This is the third video about extinction. So we've seen all of these big concepts already. Now we're going to start talking about why species go extinct. And here it is, the question, why do species go extinct? And there is an acronym for how you can remember these different causes. So HIPPO is the acronym, and here's a baby hippo. It has nothing to do with real hippos. I just think this baby hippo is really cute. Sometimes after you have a really depressing couple, 10 to 20 minutes of information, you need to look at a baby hippo. So here it is, feast your eyes on this adorable little sea pig. So what does this acronym stand for? HIPPO stands for, oh, I'm gonna write these sideways. Habitat loss and fragmentation. I stands for invasive species. P, there's two of them, so you can do this in either order. It's for pollution and population growth. And this population growth refers specifically to humans. And then O is for over harvesting. So these five drivers are um, things that can push species to extinction. And depending on the scale of each of these activities and how they interact with each other, they can be driving many, many species to extinction all at the same time. And all of these are happening currently on our planet and are the sort of, I should say, these are the causes of extinction modern version. Right, so version. Historic causes of extinction are sea level rise or sea level drop, so changes in sea level, changes in our atmospheric content of CO2 and other gases, changes in ocean chemistry, how much volcanism is happening, these movements of tectonic plates. So large scale geologic processes that contribute to global changes. This modern version is all associated with human activity, right? So we're gonna look at how these human drivers are um, working toward this modern extinction that we're seeing. Habitat loss and fragmentation is our first one. So think about an individual's habitat as this island that they live on. Uh, as a large connected habitat, like a large expanse of forest that you might see in Canada, that's like this continent sized island, right? So those islands can be large and connected like a continent, or they can be little patches, right? That have either short distances between them or long distances between them. And you can think about the ease of animals and other organisms, their ability to move between these patches. So sometimes islands exist in patches within a greater connected area. So it's patchy, but there's still kind of um, channels for these species to move through or to be connected to each other in. However, as you get increased fragmentation, the removal of these connective um, points, we start to get um, barriers that can isolate populations. And these barriers are very physical. Um, it might be, it depends on what kind of species you are, right? If you're something that is a mobile species, then that barrier might be something like um, a roadway or um, a mountain range, or um, if you're mobile in the ocean, it might be the, the rise of some um, strip of land that separates two aquatic areas, right? Um, if you're not mobile, then um, if you're a plant, then it might be you just don't have enough of the same species connected in that same area, or you don't produce um, pollen that disperses very far. So it'll be different for every organism, how much this fragmentation impacts them and the type of fragmentation. So be thinking about these small little islands. And if species are restricted to those islands, what is gonna happen to them because if you think this is one large connected population, um, it's a community here with many different individuals. But if you think about maybe just these tall pointy conifers as the population we're looking at, 
there are many of them connected in this one environment. So the population size is relatively large. Here, we have one connected population and another connected population. In this one, there's only one individual in that population. Then we break it into three. And in each time we do this, the number of individuals in each population gets smaller. So what might that lead to? The figure on the right is called an extinction vortex. So note that we start with a small population. All of the effects that we're about to talk about are either not present or are not as extreme in larger populations. So a small population is more vulnerable to just random genetic drift. So that means that there's some event, like say with those trees, that there's a fire that takes out just randomly some proportion of each of those populations. You're more likely to lose large amounts of genetic diversity with those small populations than you would be in a large connected population where the same amount of species, the same amount of individuals are taken from the population. So random genetic drift is uh, more extreme, uh, more likely to happen in small populations. The other thing that's gonna happen is inbreeding. So you can think about this um, with mountain lions, how um, their populations have been fragmented across Southern California and all of their habitat across the United States. So they would have normally had these large ranges, but now they're restricted to smaller ranges. And often the closest other organisms of their same species that they can find or get to are going to be somewhat closely related to them because they're restricted to that same habitat. So you end up mating with individuals who you're more closely related to. The only reason why that's bad is because it leads to potentially the accumulation of genes um, and versions of those genes that have um, broken copies. So within a family, um, you share similar genetics and you might inherit the same broken copy of a gene from your parents, right? And that broken copy might be relatively rare in a larger population. Each individual family might have its own broken copies of other genes, but they're, they're covered up by functional copies that you got from your other parent. But if you then mate with your siblings or somebody in your close family, you're more likely to give your children two broken copies, as opposed to um, if you outbreed and um, mate with somebody that's less closely related to you, you're more likely to get functional copies of those genes, but maybe broken copies of genes that you have functional copies of. So it just increases your chances of accumulating these broken copies of genes that you then don't have any functional options for. And that leads to a lot of genetic diseases. So here we have this loss of genetic variability that results from both of those sources which results in a reduction in individual fitness and population adaptability. So individuals tend to have more genetic diseases um, or genetic um, problems. And then along with that, your population has fewer options genetically for how to respond after some um, disaster happens, right? If a disease comes through, you're more closely related to all those organisms. So more of you are likely to be affected. All of this together, results in lower reproduction, which then leads to a smaller population, as well as these individuals that have genetic diseases um, or get wiped out by some virus leads to a higher mortality, which also leads to a smaller population. And this spiral just continues, right? Because we're now just subject to more extreme versions of these same problems we had in the first place. That's why it's called an extinction vortex. And this is a product of habitat loss and fragmentation directly. So here we see um, a mountain lion kitten. Uh, P32 shown here is one of three mountain lion kittens born recently in Santa Monica Mountains that are the result of first order inbreeding. So that means mating with siblings um, and then having uh, babies. So this is happening a lot with mountain lions. Um, and I'm not sure if it has cleft palate here. I don't know what a healthy mountain lion kit looks like, um, but Inbreeding within um, these sort of uh, large predator populations has kind of become more common um, and leads to decreased survivability and then smaller populations. So it's a big concern. So what might some of these physical barriers be? For human civilizations, we are making roads and some organisms are more likely to cross those roads than others. 
um, it is an exposure point to be moving out across those roads. You have a chance of death moving out across those roads. We also can see if you are an organism that relies on a forested habitat, how are you going to get from one of these strips to the other? This is at least one connected strip that goes all the way to this larger habitat, which is ideal. That provides corridors for um, animals to move along or for plants to move along, for species to move along. However, this one out here is going to be highly vulnerable uh, because it doesn't have a corridor to get connected to the rest of these species. So when we are designing environments, when we are looking at restoration, we are trying to form those corridors and give species the chance to be connected to each other and to migrate if they need to. Here we have some suburbs. You can imagine what would happen if a mountain lion were to make its way into one of these from its possible habitat, right? Maybe it's trying to get from this habitat to this larger habitat and maybe it's gonna eat a cat or be seen by a child um, in its progress to that other habitat and then maybe it'll get put down. There are many invasive species across the planet. Um, some of them are plants, some of them are mollusks. They range um, throughout the, the groups of organisms that we bring around either on purpose or on accident. These two have been brought around on purpose. So we have our house cats and our American bullfrog. Both of these are sources of extinction um, and major drivers of extinction for a lot of smaller species, uh, songbirds, small mammals, other amphibians, reptiles, insects. All of those are highly at risk from these two species that we have brought all around the planet. Um, so house cats, if they are in your house, are not a problem because then you are feeding them and they're not out there killing other animals. Feral cats or owned cats that are allowed to go out ranging are going to be out there killing all kinds of stuff. And these are particularly damaging on islands. Um, I have a friend whose job it was to go to islands um, every year and trap and kill cats because they are such a huge problem in these um, ecosystems where those animals are all naive to those predators. So they'll be nesting on the ground, just eggs on the ground and um, birds on the ground, right? You can't have that if there's a cat. They're not adapted to that predator. So cats can very quickly go wipe out all the birds on an island or go wipe out all the amphibian species on an island who aren't adapted to hide or defend themselves from that predator. American bullfrogs are also highly invasive. Um, they were brought around by people as a food source because people like to eat their legs. Um, so bullfrogs will eat basically anything they can fit in their mouth. Um, they reproduce abundantly, um, but they need year long water to survive uh, because their tadpoles take at least a year to um, metamorphose into an adult frog. So if they don't have standing water all year round, they won't make it. However, here in Humboldt County, we see bullfrogs spreading around because people have put in all of these year round ponds that wouldn't normally be here, right? Because we have this dry season that would dry up all those ponds. But now we have standing year round ponds so that people can water their marijuana plants in the dry season. Um, and there's lots of other ponds that people have put in just for ornamental purposes. But a huge source in Southern Humboldt are these um, ponds that people have to then water their plants in the summertime. And those often get infested with American bullfrogs, which even their tadpoles can eat other species. Um, and so that's leading to declines in other amphibian species um, and insects. And even small mammals, they'll eat mice. Another important source of or driver of extinction is pollution. So we often think of pollution just as chemical pollution. And this is an uh, infographic showing the difference between bioaccumulation and biomagnification. So bioaccumulation is often conflated with biomagnification. It's the increase in concentration of a pollutant in a single organism. So over the course of this orange fish's life, it's in the ocean um, eating contents um, that are um, have mercury in them, right? So it is accumulating mercury within itself as a single organism. Biomagnification is the movement of that mercury from fish to fish, and it accumulates in the kind of top of the food chain fish predator, right? So like an orca is going to get a lot of um, mercury accumulating in it from its food sources, but it's magnified. So it's biomagnification as it moves up the food chain.
I'll put a link to this video in the description. You should definitely watch it. Um, notice that he has an air horn by his, I guess that's his right elbow. Um, thinking about other types of pollution that aren't chemical. So what else do we do as humans that pollutes an environment for other organisms? Think about light pollution, how when we you know, move to an island and um, start putting up buildings that have lights and street lights, and now we have this bright light source at night, and then a turtle goes and lays their eggs, and normally when those um, turtles hatch, they would go toward the brightest source of light, which might be the moon over the ocean, right? Um, but now they head inland toward this bright city because they have evolved over this long period of time to go toward the strongest light source. But that light source now for them has changed and no longer means the same thing. So light pollution is one, noise pollution is another. Many species use sound to communicate. And that's what this video is about, um, about how marine organisms communicate to each other through the water medium. And then we want to go in to the ocean and do this sonic fracking, um, searching for oil sources. Um, I don't know if it's fracking, it's some kind of sonic uh, kind of puncturing or <laughs> palpating of the surface. I'm bouncing myself around over here. Um, but it's this incredibly loud noise and it happens something like every 10 seconds, some short interval where it's gonna be highly disruptive to marine organisms trying to communicate with each other. In addition to the physical vibrations from that sound and these organisms that have these sort of soft bodies that you can jellify, like liquefy their insides from vibrating them too much. So thinking about other sources of pollution, not just chemical pollution, but also noise pollution and light pollution.